All right. Section 9, Unit 9, Chapter 9. Cold War, 1945 to 1990. Now, let's point out a couple of things. First of all, once more when you go to college, you will not take a course in U.S. history from before Christopher Columbus through to the end of the Cold War. It's way too much. You could spend an entire four years simply studying different aspects of the Cold War. And so, in this review video, I'm going to hit some key highlights and hope you get enough that you, you can pull it together, sort of get the themes that are here. Um, but we're not going to be able to touch on everything. Okay, first thing, 1945 to 1990. 1945 is the end of the Second World War, of course, which is really considered the beginning of the Cold War. Soviet Union comes into existence with the Russian Revolution during World War I. Through the 1920s and 30s, um, the United States had a very um, tense relationship with it. We didn't have a lot of interaction with Russia, but to the, to the degree we did, we looked at it with suspicion and fear. One of the problems with communism is... Um, just like many other philosophies and many religions, it it believes in itself and believes it has an obligation to spread. So the fear about the Soviet Union was always that, you know, it wasn't a, a country like, I don't know, Italy or Denmark that was going to stay within its borders and do its thing. It would spread its ideas, its revolutionary notions, its atheistic revolution, its socialistic revolution to the rest of the world. During World War II, we put all that aside. The enemy of my enemy is my friend. And even though Franklin Delano Roosevelt did not trust Stalin one little bit, and neither did Winston Churchill, they cooperated with him because we needed the Soviets to be attacking the Nazis <coughs> from the other side of Europe. The minute that war is over, though, we go back to this old-fashioned conflict, um, Cold War, in that it wasn't hot. There was not shooting most of the time. There was not an open confrontation. So it was a lot of tension. It was a lot of outmaneuvering each other. It was a lot of threats. And it was a lot of what we call proxy wars. That is, a proxy is somebody who stands in the place of somebody else. So when you put this period together, um, the Korean War, the Vietnam War, these are what are called proxy wars. The Korean War, in certain aspects, was about South Korea versus North Korea. Really, it was about the U.S. versus the Soviet Union and China. The Vietnam War, yes, there were local aspects that had to do with Vietnam itself, but it was largely, again, the U.S. versus the Soviet Union. Okay, so we take it back. After World War II, ideological differences led to political differ uh, tensions between the United States and the Soviet Union. In an attempt to hold Soviet uh, influence, U.S. pursued a policy of containment. Containment is the big word to know. To contain, that is to keep communism where it is and not let it out. We knew we couldn't convert the Soviet Union, so to speak, but we could keep it from spreading. The big picture, or I guess a medium-sized picture, really, um, as World War II ended, the facts on the ground gave Eastern Europe to the Soviet Union and Western Europe to the U.S., Britain, and France. The Yalta Conference was held in 1945, early 1945, at a place called Yalta, which is in the Crimea, which is in the southern part of Ukraine. <laughs> It was a convenient meeting spot um, at that moment for Winston Churchill, Joseph Stalin, and Franklin Delano Roosevelt to meet to talk about some aspects of the end of the war and how things were going to be managed afterward. And there are the three of them there. Uh, Churchill, of course, Stalin, and FDR, and various aides and so on behind them. If FDR looks ridiculously ill, it's because he is. Nobody knew it at the time, but he was um, 
a man, the clock was ticking on his life. Uh, he was very sick by this point. This was kept largely from the public. So, but he went to Yalta anyway and met. Okay, the thing to know about Yalta is they agree on certain things, including they agreed um, to demand unconditional surrender by Germany. So Germany was not going to be able, Nazi Germany was not going to be able to set, well, we'll surrender if you do thus and so. Nope, you're just done. That was the decision. They also allowed certain things to um, go on. The, the temporary provisional government of part of Poland, which was a communist Soviet-run government. The Soviets by this time were already into Poland, having sort of reconquered from the east, away from the, the Nazis. Um, Churchill and FDR did not trust Stalin at all, but they were very cagey about how they played him. So they were willing to give him that, but they kept him sort of limited. And I think probably um, you could say that FDR and Churchill had plans for how they were going to handle Stalin after the war. There's a problem, though. In March of 1945 which is um, was about, I guess, about a month after the Yalta conference, FDR dies. Suddenly and not suddenly. As far as the rest of the world was concerned, it was sudden. Um, but the, his immediate family had some sense that he was very ill. So, having died, the, the Allies win the war, they knock out Germany. May of 1945, they have the surrender, but they still have the Pacific to do. What are we going to do about Japan? So in the summer of 1945, Germany's done, but we still have to think about Japan. They meet at Potsdam. Potsdam is uh, um, just outside of Berlin. So now that they've conquered the territory, they go uh, to the capital of Germany, the conquered capital of Germany, really a suburb of it, and the three of them meet. The three who? Well, this is the thing. Now, it's Stalin again, who is a very sharp, very cagey, very ruthless guy. It's Clement Attlee. Churchill has lost an election. The minute the war was over, the British people thanked Churchill very much for all that he had done, and then got rid of him. Churchill was viewed as a wartime prime minister, but people really didn't want him running the country afterwards. He was used to having his way, not a particularly flexible guy, very inspiring in certain aspects in wartime, but, you know, considered a little bit too full of himself for afterward. So Clement Attlee, who was one of the cabinet ministers, is elected prime minister. And Attlee was a very intelligent man, but not as ruthless as Stalin. And in the middle here you have, of course, um, Harry Truman, President of the United States, had been Vice President and took over. Truman was also not stupid, but he was very ill-informed. FDR had never briefed him on anything. Nowadays, the President and Vice President meet probably almost daily. They certainly talk daily. They both receive the same intelligence briefings. They both get the same um, information from the CIA. They both get the same assessments on foreign affairs. When Truman became president, he had met with FDR once. They had had lunch. That's it. He knew nothing about the atomic bomb program. They had to brief him on that when he became president. Um, and he had not been in on any of the negotiations, any of the, the back and forth during the war. So when he meets Stalin, he meets him for the first time with no experience of the man, no advice from FDR on how to deal with him. Um, again, not stupid, but in a position where Stalin could have his way. This is the situation that you're in at the end of um, the war. The Soviet Union 
is sitting on the eastern part of Germany, Poland, what is going to be now that we're post-war Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Romania, and then just move it down a bit, Bulgaria down here. All the green, you've got Soviet troops all over or effectively have that. The uh, sort of orange over here, this of course is the Allies, UK, Britain, uh, uh, is Britain, US, and France. And we have taken Italy and installed by then a democratic, non-fascist government. We are sitting on Belgium, the Netherlands, Denmark, Luxembourg. They have a great tradition of being democratic countries. We know that they simply need um, a little room and time to rebuild their government. And the Allies are sitting on the western part of Germany. So, um, when these three guys get together, you wind up with a situation where the situation on the ground is uh, the Soviets, if I can find the, the thing here, here we go. The Soviets are in place. Truman is worried. The war in Asia is not over. Stalin is now turning his attention to Asia. If he gets in on the war with Japan, he's going to start taking pieces of Asia, too. One of the reasons, as uh, I mentioned in the previous lecture, that um, Truman uses the atomic bomb probably is because he needs to end the war in Japan very quickly, because if he doesn't, the Russians will take advantage. Stalin creates pathways to solidify his power at Potsdam. He creates various mechanisms and provisional governments that really are going to let him um, keep control of Eastern Europe. So, uh, as I say here, um, the Allies are building up Western-style democracies in uh, the West. The Soviets are sitting on all of these countries. And the question now is, what do we do about it? That is, what do the Allies do? We've got Germany sitting there in the middle. Now, what do you do? You're going to have to create a country. You've got a whole lot of Germans still living there. How do you denazify it? Which was the word that was used, denazification. After all, the Nazis had been running the government there for years. How were you going to keep the lights on, keep the waterworks going, keep the mail being delivered? without people who possibly had been part of the Nazi party before this. How are you going to get people who had elected Adolf Hitler, after all, to turn away from that and start electing a new government that is, you know, more human? How do we help them build up the attitudes, not just the institutions, you know, not just create a Congress for them or something, but the attitudes that go with a democracy, civilized discourse, um, and help them build a strong economy. The original idea was to democratize a new Germany that would be co-run by the whole of the Allies until it was stable and strong. But the Soviets object. They don't want to share power over this new Germany with the West, and they're sitting on a chunk of Germany themselves, so Germany winds up getting partitioned. East Germany becomes a Soviet satellite, we say. It's a separate country, but one that is totally dependent on the Soviet Union. West Germany becomes a Western-style capitalist democracy. It is occupied initially by the U.S., Britain, and France. <coughs> we provide the police in the streets and uh, uh, some order and help them start to organize themselves. Um, but the goal is that it will become self-governing. Berlin, separately, is an island unto itself over there. So this is Germany, and you've got West Germany and East Germany. And then you have, you see Berlin over here? Well, this is what Berlin looks like. Berlin itself is divided in two. East Berlin belonging to the Soviets and part of Eastern East Germany. 
West Berlin, co-occupied by the Americans, the British, and the French, again to provide sort of police and, and some, some initial government. But West Germany, uh, West uh, Berlin, is f really a part of West Germany. And so right between the two, you've got a border through the middle of this city dividing people. You have heard about, perhaps, the Berlin Wall. Be aware, the Berlin Wall does not happen until 1961. So the Berlin Wall is not part of this initial division. That takes years before that happens. But the division is there even if the wall is not. And I just show you the same spot in two different eras. This is today without the division. Germany is again one unified country. And you can see, um, you know, there's a street that runs through here. There's, there's people who walk back and forth. This is a gate, uh, the Brandenburg Gate it's called. People walk through here. And at the time, it went right through this very heart of Berlin itself. Uh, I'll come back to that. So, this is the situation you've got. Okay, whoops. So, these decisions that we just talked about, to allow the Soviets to... Uh, to uh, Really, to allow both the... the, the uh, Britain, France, and the U.S., and the Soviets, to administer whatever territory they're sitting on, as applies to Poland and Eastern Europe and splitting West Germany, created, really, the Cold War. That gave the Soviets territory in Europe facing territory that was allied with the U.S. So, as see above, I say for that, as the two sides dig in, that's Cold War begins. Now, we're going to trace containment policies. Let's talk about this. Once the two sides have dug in, the American policy, the U.S. policy toward the Soviets was containment. That's the word to know. What to do about the expansion of communism and Soviet influence? Oops, I... I annotate these as we go. You contain it. Stop its spread. You can't realistically overturn it where it exists. If you try to turn um, Soviet Union or, or even Hungary at this point back into a liberal democracy, you risk World War III. If we had invaded Poland to free it from Soviet domination, we, ex we risked World War III. But we say we can hold communism where it is. Okay, in 1947, so just two years after the war, Harry Truman gives a speech which comes to be called the Truman Doctrine. Remember the Monroe Doctrine that said we would protect the new democracies in the Western Hemisphere? and the Roosevelt corollary that, corollary that said we would interfere in the democracies in the Western Hemisphere to protect them from themselves and sort of act as the cop of the Western Hemisphere. Well, now Truman says um, we are going to be the cop defending democracies everywhere. Just as a little background, Truman faces problems in Greece and Turkey. There's expanding Soviet influence fear of Soviet nudging of weak or needy governments, and communist partisan rebellions. You have these little pockets of pro-Soviet rebels in some of these countries. So Truman gives this speech in which he says, I believe it must be the policy of the United States to support free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation. Subjugation. Juga actually comes from a Latin word that means yoke as in when you, when you um, shackle or yoke two oxen together. So to subjugate somebody is to put them uh, under chains. So I believe we have to support free people who are resisting an attempt to chain them by armed minorities, that would be 
small group revolutionaries, or by outside pressures, and there what he means is the Soviets. He says, I believe that we must assist free peoples to work out their own destinies in their own way. So we're going to support democracy. I believe that our help should be primarily through economic and financial aid, which is essential to economic stability and orderly political processes. So he says, primarily, not only, it's a little bit like dollar diplomacy. Remember back from William Howard Taft. We're going to use the United States' huge economic power to help countries build strong um, economies, and this will allow them to resist outside pressures from places like the Soviets and to have good, stable government so they're not weak in the face of rebels. So if a, communi a country is a communist minority inside trying to take over, or if communist Soviets uh, are attempting to pull into Soviet sphere of influence a country, we will intervene primarily through money, but not necessarily only through money. Maybe I should clarify that. Truman has a little bit of the big stick, remember from Teddy Roosevelt, with him. We're no longer the cop of the Western Hemisphere. We will defend democracies, using dollar diplomacy or more, everywhere. Now, are there practical examples of this? The Marshall Plan. See, Truman Doctrine, I say. So, you got to know this first. Marshall Plan. How do we keep um, West Germany and other countries from going communist? So I should point out, this is named for, whoop, if I can do this, former General George Marshall, that's worth knowing. Now, Secretary oops, of State. Okay, I'm trying to do this one-handed at the moment. Um, okay, so uh, George Marshall, we might remember him from World War II. After the war, he becomes our Secretary of State. And he makes a famous speech on behalf of Truman in which he lays out this plan. Massive financial aid to help Germany... I should point out, like other countries, like Japan, from going communist, uh, massive financial aid to help them rebuild their economies. Don't make treaty of Versailles mistake. Uh -huh. So after the Treaty of Versailles, we had really destroyed Germany, and it had led eventually to Adolf Hitler. Marshall saying, let's not do that again. Let's help them get a good, strong economy. A strong economy will keep people from rebelling. A strong economy means a strong middle class. A middle class has something to lose. It's the very poor that are desperate. So a middle class who's got a, a nice life, solid possessions, a good future, they don't want to get involved with communism or instability. Strong basic industries and a strong economic system will have long-lasting results. If we can get the economy strong in its fundamentals, <coughs> it'll be good for years. The Marshall Plan is pretty successful. Um, I should, I guess, point that out, right? I can do this. Both the German and Japanese economies recover very, very quickly, and neither one has a significant um, communist uh, uh, influence, or and neither one takes a pro-Soviet position. East Germany, of course, remains communist because they are now part of that set of satellite countries to the Soviet Union. 
The first real test of the Truman Doctrine, America's Resolve, is the Berlin Blockade. Again, this is not the Berlin Wall. Don't get them confused. 1948, the Soviets cut off all trains and cars and trucks and so on from West Berlin. Remember, they're surrounding it. So let me pull this up again. So the Soviets are here. All of the gray is East Germany. So they cut off West Berlin. West Berlin is a little island in the middle of East Germany. They're trying to starve them out, and it's winter. <coughs> they depend on coal to heat their homes. Everything in West Berlin has to be trucked in or brought in on train. Without that, you, they're going to starve to death, and they are going to freeze to death. So the United States has to come up with a plan, and they come up with a thing called oops, the Berlin Airlift. We fly all of that stuff. Now think about these are the you see these are the uh, um, four engine propeller planes. We do not have jets yet doing this. You see, these are relatively small planes compared to what you might have today. And so how much cargo can they actually carry? You have to supply a city of millions of people with all of their food, medicine, and coal needs to heat themselves in addition to other kinds of supplies. This was a crazy idea. It was, it was ridiculous to think it could work. And the startling thing, the astounding thing is, it did. The United States organized in West Germany, so Soviets couldn't touch them, a massive airlift operation with um, these cargo planes lined up. This is just a tiny group of them. Oops, no, I'm looking for, there we go. And running this system from over here, this is all uh, West Germany, into Berlin and back out again. So they would bring them in, there, would, there were uh, two airports in, uh, um, in Berlin that they could get to. And they would run them almost like a railroad operation. They'd come in come and drop their cargo and come back out again they had to land they had to they had to empty the plane with lightning speed and get it back up in the air to get it out so the next plane could come in remember this is an age without any computers they're doing this all with like index cards on on big tables uh to make this organized and down here shows you what it looks like if you're standing on the ground and looking up in order to make this work, they had uh, five layers of planes operating simultaneously. In each level, the planes had 15 minutes apart. One would land, you had about 15 minutes to get it um, completely emptied and up and out of there again before the next one had to land. And the, the planes were staggered so that you actually had, if you look at this, a continuous run. This is here. At the same time, this is here. At the same time, this is here. At the same time, this is here. And so you have this um, uh, three-minute headway between planes because they're on different layers, yeah? And this was how they kept them from bumping into each other. 500 feet, which is not a lot when you're um, flying aircraft. This was an extraordinary thing, and they did it for weeks. Uh Nobody thought this could work, and we made it work. I, I just mentioned it to you. I know I'm going on a bit, but it's, a, it's an extraordinary moment. And this is a famous thing here. So the kids would come out. As you came into the airport, the airports were right near the border with East Germany. Um, East German kids, um, as well as West German kids, would sort of gather right outside the airport as the planes are coming in and watch them come in. And... The, there was a um, airman, U.S. Uh, 
uh, Air Force enlisted guy who started bringing up a handful of Hershey bars and he would toss them out to the kids because the kids had nothing. They had they couldn't get candy. They couldn't get chocolate. And German kids love chocolate. They could barely get enough food to eat. So he would toss them out to them. The Army found out about this. or the I should say the Air Force at this time found out about it, thought it was such a great idea that it became part of the flights. And the candy bombers, they were called, they would come in and just before they hit the airport, they'd open the door and drop out, you know, tons of, of Hershey bars to these poor kids who are out here. It's a, it's a good story. Anyway, the um, Berlin uh, airlift blockade um, I should mention that um, not only worked, but it proved that the United States was not going to put up with the Soviets playing games and we would stand up to them. That's the real importance of it. Just after that, we form NATO, N-A-T-O, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization. This exists down to this day, of course. This is the United States and its Western allies pledging mutual aid to each other to protect against an attack by the Soviets. If the Soviets had attacked any member of NATO, all the other members of NATO agreed to back them up and go after the Soviets. It remains in existence. The Soviet Union, of course, is gone now, but it remains a mutual aid organization. And the reason that Vladimir Putin invaded Ukraine, at least so he says, is because he was afraid Ukraine would join NATO, and that would put NATO right on the border of um, the current Russian Federation. So it's still there. It's still a very successful organization, a very successful military organization. Um, it works, apparently, uh, and it is pretty popular in Europe among European governments. Okay, zipping along through this. Well, this tension of the Cold War, you know, it's not just a theoretical thing overseas. In the 1940s and 50s, it really grips the American public. Americans are scared of the communists. And you have to put yourself in the head of the time and understand why. The United States developed an atomic bomb. We know this during World War II, after huge and difficult effort. Okay, 1945. 1949, the Soviets get one. How did they get it? How did they get it so quickly? It must be spies, say people. Well, the truth is, it was. It turns out that the Soviets had spies in our U.S. nuclear, or U.S. atomic program, we should call it then. That scared the hell out of people. Okay, well, that's all right. Good old American ingenuity and know-how. 1952, we develop a better atomic bomb, a thermonuclear bomb, the so-called hydrogen bomb, which is hundreds of times more powerful than the old atomic bombs. So we're ahead again. Within a year, the Soviets have one of those too. It's really beginning to freak people out. Hollywood. What does that got to do with anything? You get in the post-war period, 1940s, a bunch of American politicians who realize <coughs> now that the Germans are defeated, we need a new enemy. It may not be quite that cynical. A lot of the, the politicians in America, very conservative, did see, in, you know, sincerely saw, communism as a real threat. They're not just using it as a campaign issue. Well, just at that time, um, a bunch of scandal sheets, so these are, these are magazines and newspapers that print all the dirty details about all your favorite celebrities, start publishing salty stories claiming that many in Hollywood were secretly communists. The truth is, I am shorthanding this for you, 
Many people in Hollywood were, in fact, very liberal. That's not the same thing as communist. That is not the same thing as communist. But they had very liberal outlooks, and had become quite left-wing during the Great Depression. The economy had collapsed. People were questioning whether capitalism worked, whether it was fair. Some had briefly been communists during college, for instance. College kids experiment with all kinds of ideas, and a few of them said, oh, I'm going to piss off mom and dad, and I'm going to declare myself a communist. Some had actually joined left-wing causes, not realizing the organizations were sometimes funded by Soviets. But the truth is also that almost none could be called communists as, a, as adults or unpatriotic. So in Hollywood, you had all of these writers actors, directors. Some of them, would we would call them liberal Democrats today. You may not agree with them, but that's not communism. Some of them, when they were kids, had flirted with being rebellious and talking about the Communist Party. Some of them had joined organizations they didn't realize, honestly, were actually communist in background. But by the time you get to 1945, you would be really hard-pressed to find any of them who were unpatriotic or thought of themselves as some sort of communist spies. But the fear rises. Had they been slipping communist themes, communist ideas, into movies? Movies, of course, were the most powerful form of um, entertainment at the time. They were the most widespread... Uh, popular form of of mass culture well you know are these people poisoning our children's mind they're slipping somehow communist ideas into into kids cartoons people really believe this so you have this thing called the house on american activities committee or the house committee on Un american activities known for short as huac house on american Activ uh, activities Committee. It starts to hold hearings. I should, I guess, point out in Congress. Starts to hold hearings to uncover potential disloyalty in the entertainment industry. They called actors, they called writers, they called producers as witnesses. They demanded that they name the names of communist sympathizers. Writers, directors, actors who were so-called blacklisted, once accused, could never find work again. These are people, writers for instance, who were accused of being communist, once accused, I should say, even without proof. Others cooperated, sometimes knowing that showing support would protect themselves. So some of these Hollywood guys came forward and <clears throat> named names of guys that they thought maybe were communist, and the committee would reward those people, pat them on the back, thank you for being such a good American, and those guys knew that their careers were assured. Some of these guys were, were the ones who were named. And a simple accusation was enough to destroy your career. At the time, well, let me just, again, emphasize. How many of these people were really dangerous communists? You would be really hard-pressed to find any. Were there dangerous communists in America? Well, yeah, to a degree. Spies. Were there really communist spies in the U.S.? And the answer is, yes. 1948, Alger Hiss, famous case. Um, this was is a, a, a was a, a State Department, um, like an analyst, worked in the State Department as an advisor. And he is um, outed, if you like, as a spy. A guy named Whitaker Chambers accuses him in front of... Um, the House Committee. Young congressman named Richard Nixon, who will come up later, 
makes a name for himself at that hearing. He's the one who really goes after Hiss as a spy. The Hiss case was very controversial. Uh, Alger Hiss was c uh, uh, convicted of, a, of really a kind of minor, um, you know, putting misleading information on a government form, sort of lying on a government form. A lot of people for many years said he was completely innocent and it was all a setup. We actually now know that he was, in fact, a spy. And so they got that one right. 1950, uh, it was discovered that Klaus Fuchs was a spy. I say discovered because Fuchs had been working on the atomic bomb. And so he was one of the people, at least, that was funneling information from the Manhattan Project and some of the programs after that to the Soviets. So when we were trying to figure out how did the Soviets get the bomb so fast, part of it is because of guys like Klaus Fuchs. 1950, uh, the arrest of Julius and Ethel Rosenberg. This was a husband and wife team. Um, again, still controversial to this day. However, the evidence now, at the time the evidence was not quite as clear, but the evidence now is quite clear. Julius Rosenberg was certainly passing information on to the Soviets. Ethel at least knew it was happening. How much she was involved is a little hard to say. They were both executed for their part. Um, passing nuclear secrets to uh, people outside the United States, particularly to <coughs> the Soviets, was a capital offense. Now, why do I mention these? Uh, they're not particularly, like, the regions will probably not ask about these cases in specific, but it's to give you the idea. Swirling around in the 50s was a lot of fear of the communists, the communists, the communists. You may be tempted to think of that as a sort of conspiracy theory, and people were seeing shadows that weren't there, and monsters under their bed, and to a degree that was true as I said with the writers in Hollywood, most of what they were accused of is not really the case. Um, on the other hand, there was enough truth, and enough quite dangerous truth in people like Klaus Fuchs, that there was something to be concerned about. The problem is, strike, I will say to you, is striking the balance. How do you strike the balance between freedom of speech, you're right. If you want to believe in communist things, you have a right in the United States to um, somebody being a danger to American security. If somebody wants to write a novel that has a communist theme, you have a right under the First Amendment. Should we, I mean, we talk now about cancel culture. That was kind of what was going on with the, the, the Hollywood um, uh, communist um, uh, hearings, committee hearings. People, because they had done something dumb as, you know, college kids, or because they tended to be uh, very left-leaning in their ideas, were canceled from writing, you know, I don't know, musical comedies because they may secretly be slipping communist themes in there. So, you know, that seems kind of absurd to us, and it is, a, it is something to be concerned about the excess that goes on there, right? If things get out of hand. However, that doesn't mean there was not something, in fact, to be concerned about. The Soviet Union had a pretty active spy program in the United States. They were trying to stir up trouble. And we do have evidence of actual events like that, like the Rosenbergs or Alger Hiss. Well, all of that gets us then, that's kind of a big setup for McCarthy and McCarthyism. So, to run through this again briefly, we're talking about Senator Joseph McCarthy of Wisconsin, 1950s. Joe McCarthy had been a World War II uh, veteran. He had served... Um, in uh, the Marines, um, and comes back, runs for office, becomes a senator. He's honestly, 
he's casting around for an issue that he can sort of make a name on and he's trying to he's trying to become a big national political figure he's funded by the way in part by the kennedy family um the father joseph kennedy was a very rich guy wanted to run his son john kennedy for president someday he, that would happen later but he was afraid running a Catholic for president wouldn't get any place. Al Smith, in 1928, has run, had run as a Catholic and been walloped because of anti-Catholic prejudice. So Kennedy had, was actually paying Joe McCarthy's campaign bills because he figured he could break the, the ground for his own son. All right, so Joe McCarthy is, he wants to be a national figure, looking around for a good, a good cause, a good issue. 1950, he stands up and gives a speech that he didn't think was going to be that big a deal. So also a true story. He he kind of thought it was just another one. Of, you know, it's a politician, you go to a luncheon and you give a speech. In it, he claimed that he had a list of 57 communists currently in the employ of the State Department. And he takes out a piece of paper and waves it around. Well... It becomes a bombshell. And every time Joe McCarthy is interviewed, the number changes. Sometimes it's 57, sometimes it's 65, sometimes it's 205, sometimes it's 95. And he never lets anybody see the famous paper on which this is supposedly written. What was on that list, nobody really knows. Um... Whether he really had a list of 57 or he was just making a guess or making it up or, again, nobody really knows. But it gets him instantly famous. So he got a Senate committee going. The Senate appointed a committee called the Tidings Committee, it was named for its chairman, to investigate this, this allegation that there were communists in the, still in the State Department. Well, they do this massive investigation, and at the end of it, they issue a big report. The official report put out by the Democrat side of the Tidings Committee says, this is all a fraud and a hoax, and McCarthy's actions were to confuse and divide the American people to a degree far beyond the hopes of the communists themselves. The Republicans on the committee also put out a report in which they accused the Democrats on the committee of being guilty of the most brazen whitewash of a treasonable conspiracy in our history. And so Congress is deeply split right along party lines as to whether or not there's anything to what McCarthy's saying. But McCarthy discovers he's got a very popular issue with his base. So he gets his own committee going. Uh, the Senate Committee on Government Operations, and he starts investigating everything. He invests possible communists in U.S. government radio stations. We had a thing called the Voice of America, which broadcast in to the Soviet Union. It was sent sort of American news over there to, to try to tell them, you know, don't you wish you weren't communist? Um, it was a big program, and it existed until, and it was based on what was done during World War II to broadcast into Germany with Allied Radio. Well, McCarthy claims the place is full of communists. Um, oh, that should be investigates. The U.S. also ran libraries in its embassies overseas. So in order to encourage people to take an interest in American culture and American history and all of the great ideas that come out of the Constitution, Declaration of Independence, American embassies around the world had this big program with libraries. And anybody, uh, this was not just in communist countries, this was every place. You could come into the American Embassy Library and had all of this, this wonderful reading material there for you to, for free. Well, McCarthy decides he's got to go into every one of those and find out because he says that there are communist books being handed out. They never really found any. One of his staffers accuses the Protestant clergy of America of being mostly, I should say, large communists. Um, okay. McCarthy then investigates the U.S. Army. 
and he began making these really baseless charges, bullying and threatening, making unfounded hints and slurs. He would he would bring in these these military officers and yell at them uh, demanding that they turn over you know the names of the communists in their ranks and if they say well we don't have any the, he'll say well did you investigate well who are we supposed to investigate well how can you know where the communists are unless you investigate and would like turn it all back on them it, it really got kind of silly at certain points and he also started going after personal enemies personal political enemies Anybody who criticized him or who um, went after him, lawyers who defended the people that he was accusing, he would find ways to try to torpedo them. By 1954, even many conservative, anti-communist activists were seeing McCarthy as a real problem. Even if you truly believe that we had communists in government, we need to investigate it, McCarthy, a lot of conservatives were saying, was not the way to do it. He's throwing around accusations with no basis. He's targeting personal enemies with evidence-free accusations. Destroying the careers of powerless government staffers. He would pick on, you know, these minor clerks and stuff and destroy their careers. And he's a United States senator. Like, you know, with a, with a sweep of his hand, he can destroy someone's reputation. Nobody could see any actual true communist threats being exposed. There may be communist spies, but McCarthy wasn't getting anywhere near them. You know, it's not as though he was turning up real threats to America. And he began to be seen as un-American, as unfair himself, just riding the issue of popularity. The real end of McCarthy comes with Edward R. Murrow. Edward R. Murrow was probably the most famous journalist in the whole United States at the time. He had been the key live radio reporter who brought World War II in Europe into American living rooms. So while people would listen to the radio in the evenings in the U.S., he was reporting from the bombs as they were falling on London during the London Blitz, telling you what it looked like. Uh, people deeply respected Murrow. Well, by 1950s, he had made the transition to TV and was one of the first guys to figure out how to do TV documentaries. So he took the videos of McCarthy's daily army hearings, turned them into a one-hour documentary so people could sit through them, and most Americans, a huge percentage of Americans, sat and watched this one evening as Murrow showed it. And sort of for the first time, they'd read about McCarthy, heard about McCarthy, but they hadn't actually seen him in action. And when they saw him in action, they saw him as a bullying, unfair, kind of nutty politician. And it began to really destroy his credibility. Once that happens, the Senate decided to censure him, that is to punish him saying, you are using the Senate for your own purposes, this is no good for anybody. And so they vote this kind of official um, warning and criticism of him. He stays in politics, he stays in the Senate, but he all of the power is kind of lost there. And actually, he, not long after, I think about two years after he was censured, he dies. He, uh, sadly, of a long-term alcoholism problem he had had. The word McCarthyism comes from his name. McCarthyism and witch hunt, which was also used of what he did, have come to mean using government power, formal, like you know, going after somebody in court, or informal, like embarrassing them, to make baseless charges against people you disagree with or who are just political enemies, looking for conspiracies that aren't actually there, labeling dissenting opinion as treason. So if you try to wipe out somebody just on a kind of smear, that's McCarthyism, and it goes back to him. As I said, was there no communist threat in America? Wrong. There was. 
we we did have uh, as i said after the soviet union fell and they opened up the archives of the soviet spies in moscow we found out that there was even more than we knew but Mac none of it none of it was touched by mccarthy so you can you know be using a legitimate problem in very illegitimate ways okay we continue now with cold war all right um so let's talk about korea end of the um world war ii japan we know during world war ii had you know, japanese islands had occupied all of this area french indochina down here we'll come back to that um manchuria which is northern china uh etc etc including this which is the korean peninsula which sticks off of manchuria there and is right by the uh, the soviet union yeah okay at the end of the war with japan defeated the allies had taken this all back the Soviets had moved into Korea. We had moved in, the, the U.S. and our allies had moved in to Korea. And Korea had been largely partitioned. Just like Germany had been split in two, Korea had been split in two. 1949, China goes communist. The ongoing battle between Mao Zedong and the communist forces and Chiang Kai-shek and the what are called the nationalist Chinese forces, uh, Chiang Kai-shek gets defeated. He winds up over here on this little island called Formosa. We call it Taiwan. Mainland China becomes communist China. So you have communist China all the way of all of this, Soviet Union, Korea, and Korea is split into two. The 38th parallel here is what separates South Korea, allied with the Western powers, and North Korea, allied with now Communist China and Soviet Union in the North. Okay. 1950, North Korea invades South Korea to, quote, unify Korea <coughs> as one country again. That division on the 38th parallel was completely artificial. The Korean people are have a single history as a language group, an ethnic group, if you like. So they thought, well, you know, we want to unite, but we want to unite under a communist government. South Koreans not so happy about that. And so the Korean War breaks out. The United States responds to the Korean War by jumping in on the side of the United Nations. The point of the United Nations was to protect its members. If um, any country was attacked by another unjustly, and the UN decided this was an unfair attack, it was the job of the other members of the UN to jump in and protect them. It's the whole point of the organization. And so the United States did this. We had um, jumped in along with, I should say, British forces, Australian forces, although it was primarily an American operation. North Koreans have been fabulously successful. They had come down and uh, squeezed the South Koreans into this little piece here. U.S. troops, um, backed up by some of our allies, had charged in the other direction, pushed the North Koreans all the way up almost to the Yalu River here, which is there, the um, uh, the border with China. And by that time, the Chinese in particular and the Soviets were providing the North Koreans with a lot of support. The Korean War, therefore, is never called a war, technically. It is a police action. We are protecting, policing the treaties on behalf of the South Koreans. But it is a proxy war. It is the United States and the Soviet Union, with at, at its that time, China. China would break with the Soviets later. It was us fighting them using these surrogates on our behalf. Yeah? 
So the Korean War, if I pull this down a bit, becomes this way for us to fight the Cold War using other people as a hot war. What's to know? General Douglas MacArthur, remember him from World War II, is put in command of this operation. He gets up toward the Yalu River and he insists on wanting to keep going. Here is an opportunity to reconquer all of North Korea, occupy it, make it not communist, and go after China, going after China and the Soviet Union. That could have triggered a nuclear war. And MacArthur was prepared for that. In fact, he advocated using nuclear weapons in Korea, and he advocated going after China, which he believed was still vulnerable enough that it could be taken back from the communists. Well, MacArthur was commander, but MacArthur is a general, and uniformed services work for the president. We have civilian control of the military. You should know that from the Constitution. And Harry Truman, president, says, absolutely no. This is a defensive war. We are fighting a limited, what was known as a police action to protect South Korea, and withdraw to the 38th parallel border, the border back basically from before the war. We are there to contain, not roll back, communism, because he doesn't believe it is in America's interest or anyone else's to trigger a world war. He thinks MacArthur is so far off the reservation on this. Truman takes a heavy political hit for this. America has a very powerful anti-communist lobby. We know this from the Cold War stuff we have talked about. Truman is seen as being soft on communists. MacArthur is seen as a war hero. So, while he's not universally popular, he has a base. Truman is not universally hated for, for his action in Korea, but he does not have 100% of the country behind him. The Korean War never actually ends. It is still technically underway today. There is an armistice, which is to say a truce, but no actual peace treaty. So the North Koreans and South Koreans still face them, uh, each other across their border. There is still occasional minor hostilities that break out. Um, and North Korea continues as a, quote, communist regime. However, uh, this is not going to be on the Regents' exam. I just point out, can you really call North Korea communist? Communism is a philosophy. It has an economic aspect to it, as a political aspect to it. One of the things communism does not actually endorse is dictatorships, and certainly inherited dictatorships. So while North Korea can, calls itself a communist nation, in fact, the family that runs it, that is now run it for three generations, functions like a dynasty, and there's almost a religious aspect to it. The leaders of North Korea are, are uh, treated in their propaganda almost like gods. They are much closer to being emperors in almost a theocratic, that is a, a rule by religion kind of system, than it is a traditional communist system. But they claim to be allied in a, with, with uh, the communist cause, which is why we class it as that. And certainly in the 1950s, they, they presented themselves that way, considered themselves to be an ally of the Soviet Union, of the People's Republic of China, Communist China, and as part of the worldwide communist um, movement, so to speak. So it is considered a proxy for the Cold War. Okay, that then gets us to Vietnam, which is going to be 9B.